Assalamu alaikum. This is a comprehensive overview of the pharyngeal functional dysphagia starting from the very beginning. The aim of this overview is to provide comprehensive information about all the aspects of functional pharyngeal dysphagia, starting with a section on how can things go wrong, which would form the basis for interpreting the results of all the subsequent tests. A section on self-assessment tools uh, and history taking, and then examination by fiber optic endoscopic examination of swallowing fees, followed by video fluoroscopy in dysphagia, how to interpret it, and video fluoroscopy in aspiration, the penetration aspiration scale, how to uh, grade the severity of dysphagia and aspiration. How common is pharyngeal dysphagia? Quite common, in fact, but it is markedly underreported. Cerebral control of the pharyngeal swallowing is very fine and delicate, and any damage in the form of cerebrovascular accident, Parkinson, Alzheimer, or aging process is bound to provide a significant uh, problems with pharyngeal dysphagia. Also, more than two-thirds of patients who have tracheostomy, almost two-thirds of patients who have head and neck oncology, and about 10 to 20 percent of patients with gastroesophageal reflux, and about 7 percent of patients following a general anesthetic. This sums it all. The ultimate aim of the pharyngeal swallowing is to transfer a well-prepared bolus from the oral cavity to the upper part of the esophagus within one second or so without spilling backwards into the oral cavity or spilling upwards into the nasopharynx or down to the larynx. The timeline is shown here. It, the whole process should take a second or so. It is divided into the preparatory stage. When the pharynx is reconfigured, it takes 0.4 seconds and then an 0.6 of the second will be taken for the clearance of the bolus from the pharynx into the upper esophagus. There may be a little bit more of time required in this black column, depending on the bolus physical uh, characters, particularly its volume. The whole process starts with the opening of the glossopalatal contact, the glossopalatal segment contact and the tongue thrust followed almost immediately by closure of the velopharyngeal junction. And then, depending on the volume of the bolus, if the volume is less than 10 milliliters or 15 milliliters, it shouldn't take any time at all to start passing through the pharynx. If it's more than 20 milliliters, it may take a little bit longer. And then the final process of clearing the pharynx from the uh, bolus would start by closure of the larynx and by the opening of the upper esophageal sphincter and the, uh, the nasopharynx would remain closed during this process as well. Now to do this, you need to generate pressure primarily by the tongue base. The tongue base uh, thrust could generate something around 130 millimeters of mercury. This is the prime force for the pharyngeal swallowing. Uh, it's not the pharyngeal pressure it's itself, which is almost half the pressure generated by the tongue that drives the movement of the bolus into the pharynx. And this pressure should generate the uh, enough movement into the bolus to reach the upper esophageal sphincter, which should be relaxed by then. And the re relaxation duration is very short and the relaxation pressure is also very low. But if the cricopharyngeal sphincter is in a spasm, for example, the pressure could uh, be 240 millimeters of mercury, much higher than the primary pressure generated by the tongue or the pressure generated by the pharynx. So this is the summary of the pharyngeal swallowing dynamics. So how can things go wrong with the dynamics of the swallowing?
There are the general factors that affect the central integration of the process, like age, stroke, um, neurological problems, or affect the whole process at different levels, like smoking or radiotherapy. And there are the uh, specific local factors affecting either the larynx, the pharynx, the hyoid, or the tongue factors, or patients who have tracheostomy. Factors related to the larynx, if there's loss of sensation of the larynx, for example, or immobility of the vocal folds, or uh, failure of the larynx to move upwards and anteriorly during swallowing to open up the upper esophageal uh, sphincter. All these, uh, uh, all these problems can cause uh, aspiration and can cause difficulty with swallowing. As The pressure generated by the base of the tongue is the primary force for the propulsion of the bolus into the pharynx. Problems in the tongue, either affecting the pressure generated, the movement of the tongue, the anterior part of the tongue should come first in contact with the heart palate, as you can see here, followed by the loading of the bolus into the base of the tongue, and finally, the movement of the base of the tongue itself to propel the bolus into the pharynx. Any problems here can cause pharyngeal dysphagia. Problems affecting the integrity of the hyoid bone or the attached muscles, either the suprahyoid or the infrahyoid, can cause also dysphagia. The suprahyoid musculature or the platform on top of which tongue mobility and uh, pressure generation takes place, and the infrahyoid muscles through its attachment to the larynx helps in the traction of the larynx anteriorly and superiorly during the cricopharyngeus opening. And then the final stage of the pharyngeal swallowing is the opening up of the upper oesophageal sphincter and the cricopharyngeus. This is actually a two-stage uh, process. It starts with the relaxation of the cricopharyngeus. The cricopharyngeus uh, relaxes first 0.1 second before the actual opening. Now, if you follow up the bolus in there, if the cricopharyngeus is not relaxed enough, then it, the bolus would just accumulate above the cricopharyngeus as in here. The second stage of the actual opening is the traction on the cricopharyngeus by the upward and superior movement of the larynx, and this opens up the sphincter widely for the bolus to move. So it's a two-stage process, relaxation of the muscle first, and then after 0.1 second, the actual opening by the traction of the larynx anteriorly and superiorly. Up to two-thirds of the patients who have a tracheostomy tube can have pharyngeal dysphagia and or aspiration, either because of the primary cause for the tracheostomy itself or through the effect of the tracheostomy on fixing the larynx and the lower part of the neck, preventing its elevation and uh, for an anterior displacement during the cricopharyngeus opening, the ineffective cough, the loss of the glottic phasic functions, the reduced laryngeal sensation, or the impaired glottic closure. This is a list of 10 clinical tests for dysphagia and aspiration. Two of them are patients' questionnaires to assess the patient's perception of their problem, and then several tests done swallowing a certain amount of water, uh, under strict time control, monitoring any changes in their uh, pulse oximetry or the ability to swallow a certain number of times or a certain quantity of water and few tests to be done in the intensive care unit or in patients who have tracheostomy tubes. Starting with the first questionnaire, the eating assessment tool, EAT10. This is a 10 item subjective dysphagia symptoms that can be filled up with a patient within minutes.
the patient will go through the list of the 10 items and mark zero if there is no problem in that um, in an individual question or give four if there is a severe problem or anything in between depending on the grade of the severity of his symptom. And starting with questions like if there has been any weight loss or if there has been any interference with his social activities or abilities to go out for a meal, if there is any uh, extra effort needed for liquids, solids, or pills, if the swallowing is painful, if there is uh, the pleasure of the eating has been affected by the problem, or if the food stuck in the throat, or there is any cough, or if the swallowing process is stressful. The maximum score would be four for each question, and the maximum score for the questionnaire would therefore be 40, if the patient scores three or more, then there is a problem with the swallowing that need to be assessed further. The validity, reliability of the test has been uh, checked in a large cohort of patients and it's now established. And it only identifies patients who would require further assessment by things like video fluoroscopy or video endoscopy. Normal and healthy persons with no difficulty in swallowing would score very low, something below three here. But if there is a problem with the swallowing, like esophageal dysphagia or uh, cricopharyngeal dysphagia or uh, voice disorders or, um, for example, gastroesophageal reflux or a head and neck tumor affecting the swallowing process, you would expect a much higher score. The questionnaire has been used in uh, assessing the management for the various disorders of dysphagia like reflux and you can see it actually works uh, before treatment and after treatment it can show the difference with reflux with strictures and with anchors diverticulum so the validity and the reliability of the test has been established the other questionnaire is the Sydney Swallow Questionnaire, formed of 17 questions covering different aspects of dysphagia symptoms. The patient would answer the questions using a visual analog scale of straight line of 100 millimeters length, starting with a zero point where there is no problem at all, and a 100 mark would mean maximum possible severity of this particular question. The patient would put a mark along this line and the distance between his mark and the starting point would reflect his perception of the severity. The uh, total count of the uh, tests would be 1,700 and normal healthy individuals would usually score some, something below 200 mark, although there is no clear cut cutoff point and patients who have dysphagia would have marks up to 1,700. If the patient receives um, treatment for his dysphagia and the score changes by about 11% uh, uh, down the score, this is significant. Or if the patient's symptoms deteriorate by going up 7%, that's again significant. The test reliability and validity has been established on a large cohort patient. These are the 17 questions used in the Sydney Swallow questionnaire. The initial test was based on 19 questions. Two of these had been omitted during the validation uh, process and testing for reliability. These are the question for how long does it take to eat a, a scoop of ice cream and do a patient ever drool saliva during the swallowing. The other 17 questions that are left cover things like if there is any difficulty uh, of swallowing at present, if there are any difficulty with thin liquids like tea or coffee, thick liquids like milkshakes or custards, soft food like scrambled egg or mashed potatoes, hard food like steak or raw vegetables or fruits, how much difficulty with dry food like bread or biscuits, and there is any difficulty uh, swallowing saliva, and if there is any difficulty starting a swallow 
had there been any sense of food catching up in the throat or had there been any cough or choke sensation when swallowing solids or swallowing liquids and how long does it take to finish up the average meal this question was omitted uh, for the ice cream and then when you swallow food or liquids do you ever have anything going up the nose like nasal regurgitation and there is any need for a double swallow during meals and do you have ever cough up or spit out uh, food during the meals this question have been removed about drooling and how do you rate the severity of the dysphagia or the swallowing difficulty at present today and how much uh, and does your swallowing problem affect your social life, your quality of life and enjoyment with food? The third test is the repetitive saliva swallowing test. When a patient will be asked to have repetitive dry swallowing and the number of swallowing during a 30 seconds period will be counted by placing the index and the middle finger of the examiner on the hyoid and the thyroid cartilage. If the patient can manage only a two or one repetitive swallowing, dry swallowing within 30 seconds, then this is abnormal. Anything less than three is abnormal. Um, the, the test is very simple and short, doesn't take time or any resources at all, and it is very safe because there is no risk of aspiration, and there is also no risk of uh, transmitting droplets or aerosol generation. The evidence for the reliability and the validity of the test has been established to detect the risk of aspiration or pneumonia or COP. The fourth test is the water swallow test in which a patient who will be seated will be asked to swallow first a 10 milliliter of distilled water and if he managed to do this, he will then be asked to swallow 30 milliliter of water. If the patient can manage to do this within 10 seconds each time with no coughing, no aspiration, and no wet voice, then he passes the test. The sensitivity and specificity of the 10 milliliter and the 30 milliliters are around 70% for each. This is not very high because of the rather modest specificity and sensitivity of the water swallow test various modifications were uh, tested to see if this is going to improve the sensitivity or the specificity it was found by changing the amount of water uh, to 1.5 milliliter rather than 10 or 40 milliliters that the specificity has increased much and increasing the amount of water to between 90 and 100 milliliters has increased the sensitivity. The fifth test is the modified water swallow test in which a patient would be asked to swallow three milliliters of cold water. And this test, if the patient fails to swallow or if he has choking or breathing changes, then this is one. Uh, if he able to swallow the amount of water but has breathing changes, this is two. If he is able to swallow but has a choking or a wet voice, this is three. This is the cutoff point. If he swallows it successfully, this is four. If he swallows it successfully and can manage two further dry swallows within 30 seconds, then this is five. The cutoff point for normal or abnormal is three, three and anything less is abnormal. Uh, and this would increase the risk of aspiration three times. This was found to be the best test in identification of aspiration risk in cardiovascular surgery study, for example. If the patient manages to swallow successfully four or five, then we will repeat the test either twice or thrice. And the worst score obtained in the two or the three other attempts will be marked. If he continues to have four or five after 
uh, repeating the test twice or thrice, then the, uh, the swallowing is safe. The sixth test uses pulse oximetry and is very useful for hospitalized patients. It measures the drop in oxygen saturation while the patient is eating or drinking. And if that drop equals to or is more than 2.5% drop in the oxygen saturation, then this is abnormal. The test uh, sensitivity and specificity increases if it is combined with the water swallow test. The idea of using the sound generated by the act of swallowing due to the passage of the bolus into the pharynx and the movement of various anatomical structures while swallowing in the screening and the analysis of dysphagia has opened up a new field of research. The sound waves could be synchronized with video fluoroscopy, which is the gold standard in the investigation for swallowing and for dysphagia. And this would help explaining the traces of the sound wave. So this would be the resting stage in the video fluoroscopy and in the soundtrack. Uh, this would be followed by the initial movements of the larynx, the hyolaryngeal excursion anteriorly and superiorly at the beginning of the swallow, uh, together with the closure of the soft palate, followed by opening of the upper oesophageal sphincter. Uh, this uh, would be marked here, and the closure of the sphincter would be marked there, and these would be the noises of the bolus while passing the upper oesophageal sphincter itself, and the traces can be seen here at a higher power, the hyoid, hyoid movement, the opening and the closure of the sphincter, and then the return of the larynx to its initial position. Um, and this is now being used by simple equipment and software attached to a um, smartphone, for example. And tests had shown that swallowing 10 milliliter of water would require time between the beginning and the end of about 438.1 milliseconds, just less than a half a second or so with that range of time. This would help further in the investigation of any delay in the initiation of the swallowing or any delay in the passage of the bolus through the hypopharynx or through the upper oesophageal sphincter the simple swallow provocation test. In this test, the supine patient would have a fine catheter placed through his nose down to the oropharynx. And through this fine catheter, a small amount of water would be injected into the pharynx. And in the first stage, an 0.4 milliliter of water would be injected. And the second stage, a 2 milliliter would be injected. Now this should initiate a swallow reflex within three seconds after the injection of the water. And anything equal to or more than three seconds is abnormal. It does not require a patient recognition and the screen is also helpful in identifying any sensory problems in the oropharynx. It's actually more sensitive and more specific than the water swallow test. And if used with a smaller amount of water injection, it gives a very high sensitivity, and the larger amount of water gives a higher degree of specificity. Test Evans Blue Dye Test, designed for patients who have tracheostomy tubes. A drop of two of methylene blue is placed into the oral cavity, and if the dye appears through the tracheostomy tube in our cannula, then this is positive for aspiration. Very simple test, bedside can be done for hospitalized patients and patients in the intensive care unit, but its accuracy is questionable, the sensitivity and the specificity is not very high. Because of the low, a sensitivity and specificity of the events blue dye test, a modification was introduced in which the dye, the methylene blue, would be mixed with the oral intake.
with either solids or thickened liquids. And the tests can be done in stages using uh, solids or liquids in different volumes. And this has markedly improved the specificity of the test up to 100%. It's the usual is somewhere around 90% and also um, helped in the improvement of the sensitivity, although it is still not very accurate. The essential examination of patients who have functional pharyngeal dysphagia is this, the fiber optic endoscopic examination of swallowing fees. This is a standard procedure of 12 different steps designed to expose and examine various parts of the larynx, the base of the tongue, the pharynx, the upper esophagus, and checking competency of these structures and checking the ability to handle food and drink and ice chips and things of the sort. And finally, uh, to see if any therapeutic maneuvers could actually improve the swallowing process. We'll go through this one by one. We start by checking the competency of the nasopharyngeal sphincter. No local anesthesia is used uh, so as not to affect the sensation of the larynx and the pharynx. The tip of the scope is introduced into the nasopharynx but kept above the level of the soft palate so as to uh, check the mobility of the soft palate and the competency of the nasopharyngeal sphincter during phonation. Next, the tip of the scope is introduced a little bit further, but kept above the level of the base of the tongue, so as to visualize the base of the tongue, the follicular, the whole of the larynx, and the whole of the pharynx during rest, at rest initially. Uh, we scan for any abnormalities or any lesions in the hypopharynx of the larynx, see if there is any protruding osteophytes, if there is any signs of laryngopharyngeal reflux, which may alter, for example, the laryngeal adducting reflex, and see the baseline of the rate of the swallowing. This should be about three uh, swallows per minute while the scope is inside the hypopharynx. Next is the pharyngeal squeeze maneuver. The patient is asked to produce a long and high pitched E and will watch for any lateral pharyngeal contraction. If this is present, like I've just seen, this uh, correlates uh, with the pharyngeal contractility strength. It's good news to have the, a positive uh, pharyngeal squeeze maneuver. It means that this patient can handle puree food even if there is reduced or even absent laryngopharyngeal sensation. The next thing is to check for any retained secretions or saliva in the hypopharynx before introducing any colored food or drink. If there is any saliva retained or in the hypopharynx, you would want to check if this is being aspirated during swallowing. You can make things easier by placing just two drops of a colored fluid to the base of the tongue and ask the patient to swallow it. Then it would be easier to trace the colored saliva. If there is any pooling of saliva in the glottic area in here or any penetration or aspiration, then the next thing would be to check if this patient can handle ice chips before introducing any food or drinks. If the special port for the introduction of the air puffs is not available, one can use the tip of the nasopharyngoscope to test for the sensation of the larynx and the pharynx. This is particularly important in the presence of retained secretions or saliva in the hypopharynx at rest. And the uh, tip of the scope can be used to touch uh, some laryngeal or pharyngeal structures and watch for the laryngeal adduction reflex and note if there is any absent reflex if one of these areas is being touched. The uh, pharyngeal wall, the base of the tongue, the aryoglottic fold, the ventricular folds or the true vocal folds. The next two steps, number six and number seven, 
would require repositioning of the tip of the scope so as to focus on the larynx rather than the pharynx. You still need to have the tip of the epiglottis in view together with other laryngeal structures. Here we would be assessing the larynx for any structural abnormalities like paralysis of the vocal folds or any other lesions. We'll would be testing the position of the vocal cords at rest or during breathing, uh, the full abduction during sniffing, full abduction during phonation, swallowing, a good cough, a good dry cough, and we'll be testing the limits of the laryngeal mobility and integrity by asking the patient to hold the breath to the count of seven or count from one to ten and asking him to produce an E with a very high pitch and an E with a very loud voice. The initial testing of the patients with ice chips before starting them on any colored food or drink would be required if the patient had not had any oral intake for a long period of time or if the patient have retained secretions and pooling of saliva in the hypopharynx or the laryngeal vestibule. It's a fairly safe method. It maximizes the sensory input due to the coldness of the eyes and also minimizes the risk of irritation or infection if it gets aspirated. If the patient can handle the swallowing of ice chips well, then he can be then um, tested with colored food and drink. If he cannot handle this and aspirated the ice chips, then whether there is any cough attempts to clear the, th the trachea and the larynx from the aspirated eyes should be noted. This would help in differentiating between uh, aspiration with or without a cough reflex uh, that is uh, stage 7 or 8 from the uh, pass scale. The next thing would be to start testing the patient with colored food and fluids. And if the patient can handle a small bolus, this can be uh, increased in volume and the rate of administration of the boluses can also be increased. And um, we will be tracing the colored food or drink to assess if there is any residual food and drink in the pharynx after the swallow and either in the pharynx or in the vellicula to see if there is any delay in the triggering of the swallowing reflex or to see if there is any penetration or aspiration of the boluses. The location of any pharyngeal residue after the swallow would help in the diagnosis. If food is retained in the vellicula, like here for example, this may point to weakness of tongue based contraction, weakness of pharyngeal contraction, or weakness of the hyolaryngeal elevation. Whereas if there is accumulation of the colored food or drink in the lower part of the pharynx, like in the piriform fossae, for example, like in here, this may point to a problem in the opening of the upper esophageal sphincter like, for example, cricopharyngeal dysmotility or weakness of the contraction of the pharyngeal muscles. Whiteouts occur often during the endoscopic examination when the moving base of the tongue and the contracting pharyngeal wall comes in contact with the tip of the nasopharyngoscope. The presence of a whiteout does not necessarily indicate that the pharyngeal contractions are normal but it tells you that it is not absent. The timing of any aspiration or laryngeal penetration in relation to the white out is also of clinical value. This is how we classify aspiration into pre-swallow or aspiration during the swallow or post the swallow. And also any residual food or drink in the pharynx or in the vellicula after the white out should be noted. Step number 10 is to notice any laryngeal penetration or any aspiration of the colored bolus into the airway. This could happen due to a variety of reasons, including incomplete glottic closure, 
impaired laryngeal sensation, reduced movement of the larynx, particularly elevation during swallowing due to any defects in the hyolaryngeal elevation, any abnormalities of the hyoid bone elevation um, during the swallowing. It can also happen if there is a reduced duration of uh, laryngeal and glottic closure during swallowing in relation to uh, a delayed swallow or a presence of pharyngeal residue or prolonged pharyngeal transient time. If there is enough residue in the hypopharynx when the uh, glottis resumes opening, there is always uh, the chance of a spillover into the airway. Step number 11 is endoscopic examination of the lower part of the hypopharynx, the cricopharyngeus area, and the upper esophageal segment. It's often not very difficult to pass the tip of the scope through the cricopharyngeus uh, segment in here into the upper part of the esophagus. And this would give some valuable information about the cricopharyngeus muscle, whether there is any strictures or spasms in there or any abnormalities in the upper part of the esophagus as well. And finally, we reach step number 12. By this stage, hopefully a clear idea about what went wrong has been formed and it's now time to try therapeutic uh, maneuvers and different strategies for rehabilitation of the defective uh, swallowing. One way of helping the patients would be adjusting the uh, um, swallowing strategies, advising patients on different ways of improving the swallowing technique. This would be covered in presentations to follow. For example, if there is a problem of pooling of uh, bolus into one of the pyriform fossae, uh, this can be helped by turning the head of the patient during swallowing to the other side. This would obliterate the uh, pyriform fossae on the other side here and prevent the accumulation of the uh, bolus in there and the potential spill over into the larynx. How to assess the pharyngeal dysphagia using video fluoroscopy? Video fluoroscopy remains a gold standard in the diagnosis, assessment, and grading of pharyngeal dysphagia. It provides a vast amount of information about any variations from the normal anatomy or physiology of the upper aerodigestive tract including how the bolus flows through the pharynx, the timing and any patterns, including regurgitation to the nasopharynx or spillover into the larynx. Because it provides such a vast amount of information, it is usual to review the video fluoroscopy several times, some of them in slow motion. It's also usual to concentrate on one of the two main aspects of pharyngeal dysphagia. If we are looking at any signs of airway invasion and aspiration, we use a validated and reliable scoring system to grade the severity, like the penetration aspiration scale. Or if we are looking for signs of pharyngeal dysphagia and obstruction to the flow of the bolus, we use again another uh, reliable and validated scoring system for pharyngeal residue, the bolus residue scale. To standardize the frame chosen from the video fluoroscopy to quantify any residual bolus. The frame selected is usually the swallow rest frame. This is defined as the lowest level of the perform sinus in relation to the cervical column immediately after the end of one swallowing act and before the next swallow is initiated. The first frame to locate the lowest position of the perform sinus is taken as the swallow rest frame. This is an example of a normal swallowing on video 
fluoroscopy. The whole of the volus was cleared promptly within a second from the pharynx by the opening of the upper esophageal sphincter, the cricopharyngeal segment, with no spillover in the larynx and no regurgitation in the nasopharynx. Well, in this example, the uh, swallowing of the bolus was not complete, and there is a residue left over in the vellicula here. And it is this residue that would need to be quantified in order to grade the severity of the pharyngeal dysphagia. There can be a residue of the bolus in two other uh, spaces plus the vellicula. It can reside in the piriform sinus, the lower part of the hypopharynx, because of a failure at the opening of the upper esophageal sphincter. It can also reside in the mid pharyngeal segment, posterior pharyngeal wall, in here. We'll now go through a quick overview of the various scales used to grade pharyngeal dysphagia by the bolus residue. Starting with this number one, the bolus residue scale, first suggested in 2015. I start with it because it's the simplest of all the scale. It's also the least time consuming and it is highly reproducible. It's very practical scale. It grades the severity of the dysphagia from one to six according to the location of uh, the bolus, whether it is present or not, just present or not in one of the three locations, the vellicula, the pyriform sinuses, or the posterior pharyngeal wall. So grade one would be no residue at all, that's normal. Grade two would be a residue only in the vellicula, that's the number two grade. Number three would be a residue either, either in the posterior pharyngeal wall or the perform sinus. And then stage number four will be a residue in the vellicula plus either the posterior pharyngeal wall or the perform sinus. And stage number five would be a residue in both the perform sinus and the posterior pharyngeal wall, and stage number six, the uh, highest possible scale, would be a residue in all three parts, the vellicula, the posterior pharyngeal wall, and the piriform sinus. This first scale, the bolus residue scale, is not only the simplest of all the scales and the least time consuming, but it's also highly reproducible. The intra and the inter rater reproducibility of the scale is almost perfect for experts, reaching about 94%. But also in the non experts, like medical students, nurses, or doctors who don't have enough experience with rating of uh, dysphagia images, would still have a 75% reproducibility. What is more important is that when the non-experts and the experts differ, it's, they differ by only one level, the up or down the scale, so that they don't get it too wrong. The bolus residue scale is simple and quick. It's also practical and reliable. But there are other ways of quantifying the amount of residue in the pharynx and using it to indicate the severity of the dysphagia. These other techniques are less used, includes obtaining a ratio between the amount of the residue in a space and a certain reference point. This reference to obtain the ratio can be the height of the residue in say the vellicula to the height of the whole of the vellicula or the width of the residue in a certain space compared to the whole of the width of the space uh, like in Hans uh, protocol or using the two uh, dimensions, the height and the width, multiplied uh, over the height and the width of the whole of the space in the method uh, described by Dyer. There is another 
uh, approach to obtaining a ratio of the res uh, residue to the bolus itself and this was advocated by the digest uh, group uh, the one uh, described by Hutchison or using another reference point uh, and another technique this is a pixel based technique rather than just visual perceptive like in here here you measure the pixels uh, in the residue compared to the pixels that could have filled up the whole of the space this is the uh, percentage full scale or you could use another reference point the amount of pixels in a space compared to the distance between the end of cervical 2 to the end of cervical 4 squared or you could use the two approaches together to obtain a ratio between the pixels in a space the whole of the space ref with a reference to the square of the distance between the end of c2 and c4 the other point to be taken into account is whether there is any penetration or aspiration of the bolus into the airway and the timing of this uh, aspiration or penetration in relation to the swallow if it happens before the swallow this is usually due to a mishandling of the bolus in the oral cavity or a delay in the swallow initiation if it happens during the swallow itself it's usually to laryngeal incompetence or failure to elevation plus of course pharyngeal overflow but what we are interested in in this presentation is aspiration after the swallow and this is usually due to a combination of a residue in the pharynx as you can see here a residue in the piriform sinuses and a residue in the um, vellicula and also perhaps a degree of deficit with the sensation of laryngeal mucosa. When the focus of the attention is the amount of aspiration during swallowing, then there is another group of scaling system, the most common of which is the eight point penetration aspiration scale, the pass which remains the gold standard for quantification and grading of aspiration. This was proposed by Rosenbach in 1996 and had several modifications after this. It's meant to describe and measure the severity of the airway penetration during swallowing by measuring the depth of the invasion into the different parts of the airway, the supraglottis, the glottis, the subglottis, and the trachea and whether the aspirated material is ejected or not ejected uh, by a cough reflex. It's a fairly reliable way of quantification of aspiration. The penetration aspiration scale is an eight point scoring system reflecting the severity of aspiration by the depth of the invasion of the aspirate material down the airway, starting with one in which there is no aspiration the material does not enter the airway the examination is normal and the most severe form of it number eight in which there is silent aspiration the aspirate material goes all the way below the vocal folds into the trachea or even the bronchi it's not ejected and there is no attempt at cough because there is failure of the sensory as well as the motor mechanisms to clear up the airway from aspiration between one and eight it goes into different levels according to the depth of the invasion in two and three the aspirate material re remains in the supraglottis above the level of the vocal cords uh, in number two the material is ejected after it penetrates into the supraglottis and number three it does not eject because there is a failure of the sensory element of the supraglottis the superior laryngeal nerve in four and five the aspirate material goes a bit deeper and contacts the vocal folds into the uh, areas of directly above the vocal fold again number four it's ejected from the airway during promptly and in number five it is not in six and in seven uh, 
the material goes below the vocal folds. And number six, again, it's ejected from the airway by a good cough reflex. And number seven, it's um, the ejection is attempted, but the material is not completely cleared. So we know that there is a sensation in the uh, subglottic and the tracheal area, some sensation, but uh, the cough is not uh, uh, effective in clearing up the airway. And number eight, the material goes all the way down uh, below the vocal folds into the trachea. It's not ejected and there is no effort uh, made to eject it because there is sensory as well as motor failure. And now we'll go through the eight different levels of the penetration aspiration score, starting from number one, pass number one. Uh, the bolus is swallowed normally. It goes, all of it will go into the hypopharynx and there is no penetration into the airway. So that's normal. That's number one. The next level is penetration aspiration score of two which is sometimes called flash penetration. You would see a very brief attempt at penetration of the bolus into the laryngeal vestibule that is promptly cleared off the larynx down the hypopharynx. This is a very brief attempt at penetration that's promptly cleared completely out of the airway and swallowed. And this can be passed as normal. It's not, um, it's not seen as an abnormality because it happens so often in normal subjects. This is followed by pass three, in which there is a penetration to the supraglottic space, but it does not clear up promptly. It does not trigger an immediate swallow response. You would see that the uh, bolus here had lingered around in the supraglottis, uh, just below the epiglottis and above the arytenoids and is not cleared. And that would make us think that the superior laryngeal nerve integrity or the sensory integrity of the supraglottis is affected. So there isn't a prompt uh, response to clear this bolus from the supraglottic space. That's pass number three. Pass number four is rare in which the aspirate material dips deeper in the supraglottic space and actually touches the vocal folds. And then it excites the swallowing reflex and it is promptly cleared completely. So you'd see that there is a little bit of aspiration here that dips into the supraglottic space above the vocal cord but it's now completely cleared off the airway. Pass number five is similar to pass number four and that the material enters the airway, dips deeper in the supraglottic space, touches the vocal fold, but this time it is not ejected from the airway. You'd see the bolus penetrating into the larynx, pulling deeper, into the supraglottic space and now touching the vocal folds. This is the arytenoid there and it's not ejected. And then we can um, question the integrity of the reflexive sensory or motor responses of both the superior laryngeal nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. In number six level, the aspirate material dips even deeper into the airway passes the vocal fold levels into the subglottic space and the trachea, but then it is promptly cleared by the cough reflex and the coughing of the material from the trachea and the subglottic space back into the supraglottis. You would see how the aspirate material dips deeper now into the subglottic space, but it's promptly cleared by the coughing into the supraglottic space and ultimately uh, swallowed by the patient. This is actually a very rare level. It's seen in about 3% only of the uh, video clips. Number seven level is similar to number six in that the aspirate material passes the vocal fold level into the trachea, 
It's also similar to number six in that there is an attempt at coughing up of the material back into the larynx, but different to number six, the cough uh, response is not effective and therefore a residual amount of the material remains into the trachea despite the effort at clearing it. You would see some aspiration here into the subglottic space and the trachea. You would see attempts at coughing, but there is a residual amount of the material in the trachea at the end because the cough reflex was not very effective. So we know that there is still some residual sensation in the recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, sensa sensation territory, but it's not effective enough to clear the airway from the aspiration. And finally, to the last level, where is, there is silent aspiration in level eight. The aspirate material passes through the larynx, the vocal fold levels, into the trachea. It's not sensed in the trachea, and there is no attempt at coughing it, and it passes directly into the airway. You see the aspirate material going directly through the trachea into the airway with no attempts at coughing. Then we know that there is an impairment of both the sensory and the motor arcs of the cough reflex. Video endoscopy and video fluoroscopy complement rather than compete with each other. There would be patients in whom a video endoscopy can bring about more information and others in whom video fluoroscopy would be better. Video endoscopy is a fairly safe procedure. The rate of the epistaxis is about seven in 10 thousands. The incidence of airway compromise during the fees examination is next to zero. The two uh, techniques, the endoscopy and the fluoroscopy, give the same diagnosis and the same uh, staging in more than three quarters of patients who have pharyngeal uh, propulsion dysphagia and more than 80% of patients who have aspiration. They would reach the same conclusion. That's a very high level of agreement. But when they differ, it is the video endoscopy that would tend to overstage the uh, degree of dysphagia or the degree of aspiration. There is a tendency for the video endoscopy to have higher scores in the penetration aspiration scale uh, compared to the video fluoroscopy, and the same applies to the bolus residue uh, scale for uh, quantification of the pharyngeal residue. The fees is more often utilized in long-term facilities uh, like care homes, because it can be performed at that site. And of course, the video fluoroscopy has to be carried out in a hospital setting. And there is uh, some also radiation exposure during the uh, video fluoroscopy examination. Um, there is also some uh, would argue that fees is more invasive due to the use of the endoscope. By this, we come to the end of this overview of functional pharyngeal dysphagia. Assalamu alaikum.